because even now, two days ago, I re I was just kind of thinking about something she said to me. I don't know if it's going to come manifest itself, but she just spoke these amazing, wonderful, positive words over me. And it was from her love. But even now, it comforts me. Like two days ago or whatever, I was comforted by it. But Tawana, my cousin, she, wow. <laughs> so... Man, what kind of show is this? <laughs> I thought you could ask me <laughs> my entertainment. So my cousin, one of the things that she did um, when I was really struggling, she worked at Bank of America. I happened to be to bank at Bank of America. Mm -hmm. And I would sometimes go to my account and there would be money there that I didn't put there. Wow. Because she didn't want me to give up. Mm. and yeah wow wow what that was I so do? encouraging it was and and even in her words she i remember her pleading with me don't stop do this daddy you have to do this wow so yeah wow that, that's gotta that's gotta be everything man Welcome to another edition of Flex On. Today's guest is a 2022 Academy Award winner, Donnie F. Wilson. My man, how you doing? I'm doing great, how are you, Mike? I'm doing good. <laughs> oh man, it's, it's so Tell people why you're laughing. Tell people why you're laughing. <laughs> okay, so Donnie's not necessarily a fan of doing interviews, but I know he has some jewels to drop. Therefore, I had to have him on the show. So I dragged him down a few flights of stairs, and here he is. <laughs> so, Donnie, is this your year or what? Yes. If I'm honest, yes. You know, uh, my modesty sometimes try to, tries to... Um, you know, dim my shine, if you will. And uh -huh. that's even hard to say because I really don't feel that there is any shine. I'm just out here trying to make it happen just like all of us, you know? <laughs> but I have to, be, I have to, I mean, I don't want to take away from, you know, all that God or the universe, whatever you choose to believe. I'm not trying to take away from any of what um, is being bestowed upon me. Mm -hmm. So uh, help me out, brother, to just to embrace it. Hey, I hear you, man. I hear. But, you know, that's because and I said that because um, Donnie F. Wilson's film, Queen of Basketball, has been nominated for an Academy Award as an executive producer for a documentary entitled Queen of Basketball. Um, what was what was your 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 first thought you had when it was announced that you are now an Academy? Academy Award nominee for your film, Queen of Basketball? You know, I would like for my answer to be something different and something that I guess everybody would expect it to be. But honestly, in my head, I'm like, oh, wow, that's a great thing. But next, <laughs> what's the next step? Winning, you know, it was like, I, I guess I'm never satisfied, you know. Uh, I kind of remind myself of the song in Hamilton, you know, about never being satisfied. Yeah, and that is me. It's and um, I'm never satisfied, and it's never enough, and it's hard for me to even see my own accomplishment sometimes because of that. Now, I made a vow to myself that I would, you know, some years ago. I'm not doing a great job with it, but I made a vow that I would you know, take time to smell the roses, the roses, appreciate my process and all that other kind of stuff. But it's very mm -hmm. difficult for me. And I don't know if that's because I'm driven or I don't know what it's due to, you know, but honestly, it wasn't the joyous, like, ah, I mean, I'm excited. And uh, you know what makes me really excited? What? When my friends are excited about it. Oh my that's God. That's what dude. gets me. <laughs> that dude. really makes me happy. It's like, wow. Dude, this is, Okay, so I, I get what you're saying because it's, you know, for us being out in, in Los Angeles for as long as we've been out here on this journey, it's so hard to enjoy the journey. Um, it, it's so difficult. So I can, I can definitely understand why you, why you say that. Um, 
Um, why do you think it's hard for you to enjoy the journey? Okay, now you're just really getting deep into it, diving right, right into it, right? Right, right, right. I think it's a lot of stuff, Mike. I think it's part of, um, you know, part of it is, I know, in growing up in the South, uh, being, you know, growing up in the Kojic Church, Church of God in Christ, for those who don't know Kojic, the acronym, um, and just not, just being humble, you know what I'm saying? And not thinking too highly of yourself. And so you're, you know, a person who has embraced that, um, the faith and all of that is, it's just kind of like you, it's a safeguard maybe. It's just this defense mechanism against being puffed up, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You, you are partners at um, Jersey Productions? And Jersey Legends Productions, yeah. Jersey I'm Legends Productions. Uh, so, yeah, Jersey Legends. Go ahead. Yes, and um, one of the greatest humans, uh, one of the greatest basketball players of all time, and one of the, like, biggest personalities of all time Shaquille O'Neal is your partner along with Michael Paris um uh I remember um and I would love for you to go into um like how all of this came about and and how and going through some stories of how you met um Michael Paris and and, and Shaquille O'Neal um I, I just for me when uh, Shaq was playing with uh the Lakers I remember coming out of a restaurant and seeing him, he, I remember he, he had a white, like a white suit on, and he looked slimmer than I thought he would look um, in person. And the brother just talked to me like, like we knew each other. I was like, dude, but I mean, dogs, you're Shaquille O'Neal. Um, what, what is it like, like, like what was it like working with them? And how did that, like, how, how did all that happen? Like, when did you first meet them? And, um, I know I'm certain things about the story, but I would like for you to. Well, I'm glad you're asking me that question today and not yesterday. Because <laughs> I was not happy with them yesterday. Okay. But anyway. <laughs> but um, so how it came, to, I used to work for Shaquille. I used to be an employee at his company, Mine Oh Mine. And basically I was his community relations director and slash publicist, if you will. And um, so I worked with them for maybe close to 17 years, I believe. And so that's how I even had a relationship. Um, when his, um, I think it was the, the, not, the season before his last season in Miami, I uh, decided I, I, I'm not here to do this. I, I moved to LA. I was now living in Miami. I moved to LA to pursue my passion to write for television and film and I'm like I'm not doing that working for a basketball player mm -hmm. you know although when we were in LA there were opportunities that came my way that kept me partially satisfied but then when we were in Miami those dried up and it was strictly basketball so um I said okay it's time for me to go and I left and I went home to Dallas Texas for a little bit to just kind of regroup and in that time, I was, my goal was always to come back to Los Angeles and to start all over again. Mm -hmm. And so when I went home, um, you know, I was like, I, I, I need to write, you know, and Dallas is a theater town. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, but it's a really bona fide theater town. And so I said, well, theater is my first love. Mm -hmm. um, I want to write. You know, maybe if I start writing while I'm here and getting some plays done, you know, it'll be, you know, something that I can go back to L.A. and say, you know, hey, I'm a writer. Here's stuff I've done. And so anyway, long story short, I wrote my first play. Um, got, got it produced, self-produced, actually. And, um, and it just kind of started from there. You know, mm -hmm. people were receptive and it led to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So um, eventually I decided to come back to Los Angeles and, it, you know, you know, the industry here is it's not an easy thing to, you know, to crack. And so I, you know, just was living my broke life, you know, my best broke life. And um, during, when it wasn't until the pandemic, actually, and this was years, I mean, I was Ubering and all that kind of stuff. And, 
It wasn't until the pandemic, I had a car accident, actually, the year before the pandemic, I had a car accident. And um, this is so crazy. Like two seconds after the car accident, I received this text message and it says, you are, your um, insurance has been uh, canceled. Two minutes after this car accident, I get this text message. I am not. I was like, what? But I wasn't worried. I'm like, I pay my insurance in advance, you know, this, whatever. And then I'm not at fault. So I wasn't even worried. Anyway, long story short, the guy, you know, he run, you know, he hits and run. And um, anyway, long story short, my insurance was canceled. They found some $16 payment that I hadn't made 20 years ago, and they deducted it from the the fee, the pay, the payment that I had made. And now I had no car. No, I couldn't get my car fixed. So now here I am, no job or anything. So it was a, it was a rough road right there for a minute. And, um, and then the next year, the pandemic hits. And I'm like, oh, shoot. You know, my life is just, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to, 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 to withstand this type of, you know, hardship. So, um, you know, but something inside of me was like, well, just write. So I wrote this play and there's this uh, comp- um, theater right around the corner from me uh, as part of a coffee shop. I said, let me just see if I can work with them and do this play. Now I'm broke, busted, ain't got nothing. And here I am trying to self-produce a play. So anyway, so I go and um, get the play done and it's the worst experience of my life. It was horrible. Had the actors quit after the first weekend. One of the actors quit and I didn't have any um, understudies. So had to cancel the thing. I had a producer coming in from Florida and said, we want to take a look at this because we may want to, you know, I have a deal with Netflix and we may want to, you know, do something. And I'm like, well, I, I, I was something was like, don't tell him not to come. But I'm like, what am I going to do? Because I don't have a play, you know. And so it got really, then all the other actors started acting weird. So I just fired everybody. And then I told the people to still come. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. So maybe like three days before they came, I said, okay, I still have this space. We still have this beautiful set. I got some friends and just did a stage reading uh, of the piece. And so they, they, they said they loved it. And I explained to them what happened and they were really impressed with my resilience. And so uh, it was like, and so the guy came out, the, um, the executive producer he came out and talked to me and he was like, you need to dump theater. There is no money. This is charity, what you're doing, all this work you put into this. And, you know, what are you benefiting? And that, I was like, you know what, he's right. You know, as much as I love theater, he's right, you know? so. Long, we get into the pandemic and I see that Shaquille is start, has started Jersey Legends Productions. And I said, okay, maybe they're not going to be able to do anything because nobody is filming. So maybe if I just write some little skits, animated skits they can put on there and maybe they'll say, oh yeah, that's right, you're all right. And they'll see how amazing I am. Mm-hmm. And they'll say, this will lead to something. So I reached out to them. I was like, okay, let's see, whatever. You know, I weren't really excited about it. So I wrote this little skit and they're like, oh, this is kind of interesting. We kind of like this. And it ended up developing into becoming a, a full short animated short film that's an incredible head noise. You can, um, it's uh, at the Cleveland International Film Festival and coming up nice. this month. Yeah, we have, we've been into several. We won the uh, New York Animated Film Festival, won first prize. Um, it's an, it's an amazing piece. So, head noise. so anyway, so that kind of like, they were like, oh, this is kind of cool. Okay. We did remember that, you know, this was something you love and they said, okay, well, why don't you work for us? And I said, uh, nah, I don't think I want to work for you guys again. What I like to do is become a partner. And so we negotiated and now I'm a partner of Jersey Legends. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> now, now that's a story. Yeah. And that's yeah. a story. Yeah. So, okay, so you are from Dallas. Yes. When when was it 
that you 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 figured out that you had a a love for for writing was it um in elementary school um when when was it and and was it nurtured never nurtured well i think it, well it no it was never nurtured that's true so when i um my mother always, or my family and stuff, I always like telling stories. And, you know, when you get together with family, I'd always be the one with the creative mind and putting together stories and to perform. You know, I think we've heard this story from a lot of people, but yeah, so I guess as black folk, you know, that's the outlet, your family come over for functions and, you know, you just kind of perform for them. And those who enjoy acting or storytelling, that's where they shine. So um, I had that, but I didn't, I didn't realize it was a thing. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't know it was any different than what anybody else had or did. And so when I went to college, I, um, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. Nothing really interested me. I just knew that I was supposed to go to college, you know? I mean, dude, we are, we are responsible at age 17 to know what we want to do with the rest of our lives. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So, right. so, so, so go ahead. And, you know, and it's funny you say that, and I think it's all in preparation. Uh, I remember when I first moved to Los Angeles, I was at the beach and uh, there was this woman and her daughter, white woman and her daughter, they were riding bikes and the little girl was right behind her now. And when I was coming up on the conversation, I just heard the mother say um, she was challenging the daughter about and the girl was probably about 10, 11. And she was challenging this little girl and asking her about her purpose and what she wanted to be. And I just thought about that. And I was like, how amazing is that if I had had someone in my life to, to challenge me to, to even just to open up my eyes. I was the first person to graduate from college in my family. You know, my family was just glad I was going, you know what I'm saying? They didn't care what study, study what, just go to college, get a degree. Right. And so I, I, I didn't know, you know, I just had no idea. So, um, I, um, oh, backtrack a little bit. <laughs> when I was in high school, I went to a high school, uh, I guess it would be something kind of like what a magnet school is now, if magnet schools are still exist, I don't even know if they still exist, but um, where you uh -huh. can go and take specialized studies and certain mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. trades or, I mean, all kinds of things. So I went to a pretty unique high school at the time. And um, I think it may have been even the first magnet school of its sorts, I'm not sure. But um, so I went in and I Again, not knowing, man, I, I just, I, I look back now and like, how did I even get become anything? Because I was so, had no guidance, you know? So I said, okay, I'm gonna do air conditioned refrigeration. So I'll get into the air conditioned refrigeration cluster. Two days in, I'm like, oh my God, I don't like this. I don't want, what am I doing? And so uh, I was walking out of class thinking, oh my God, I gotta get out of this. This is horrible, you know? And then I passed by the motion picture production cluster. Wow. So I peek inside and I'm like, okay, maybe I should do this. Just on a whim. And so I talked to the, 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 the teacher that was over it. He helped me transfer into that situation. And I loved it. I loved the storytelling component. I loved the editing. I loved everything about putting together a movie, right? And one of the things I have always had for some reason, I've always had some teacher to take interest in me and want to expose me. So one of the things that I'm so grateful for that people have seen something in me that they've wanted to expose me to other things outside of my small universe mm -hmm. in South Dallas, you know what I'm saying, in the hood. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, so anyway, so now going back to college, I've totally forgotten about the motion picture production thing. And I'm like, well, okay, maybe I should just do it, become a journalist. So I entered into the journalism program um, and then I saw, I was, before I actually hadn't registered yet, and then I saw radio, television, film. I was like, okay, I do like storytelling, you know, and 
this is creative storytelling that I like. So anyway, that's what I did. I studied radio, television, uh, and film, and that's what my degree is in from University of North Texas. Um, so that's kind of how I just landed here. But even after graduating, I didn't pursue it. Um, I just kind of, I went to work for the National Maradona Program. And um, I went to, I remember the thing that kind of springboarded me moving to Los Angeles was I'd gone to a movie and it was Hugh Grant, it was a Hugh Grant movie and it was horrible. It was the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> you said, I can, I can do something horrible like that. <laughs> I, no, I said, I could do something way better than that. It may be, oh yeah, you're right. But I could, yeah, I said, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with this. So I reached out to the, uh, uh, the, the Academy of Arts and Sciences here. And I met this lady, Beth. And we were talking and she was very encouraging. And I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna establish this relationship with her. She's gonna, you know, get help me get a job there. Mm -hmm. And then I could move to LA and I'll be in the environment. So I'm talking and everything. And then one day she goes, Donnie, I'm not gonna talk to you anymore until you move to Los Angeles. I'm like, but I don't have a job. She goes, figure it out. I'm like, is she crazy? Now, does she know how expensive LA is? And she's like, I'm not, I'm done. So wow. good luck to you. Call wow. me when you get to LA. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. What's the wow? What's the wow? The, the, the wow is it's like that's that tough love. That's uh -huh. like I'm gonna kick you out the nest. And why don't you just give me a job? That's what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I'm gonna kick you out the nest and you're gonna fly. <laughs> and if you don't, you're gonna fall, but eventually you're gonna learn that you're gonna need, if you're a bird, you're gonna need to learn how to fly. So bring your butt, fly your butt out to LA. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I was so angry with her. I was so very angry. I'm like, how does she, what am I gonna do? And so I said, okay, I'm gonna save up $2,000 and I'm gonna go. So every time I would get to like 16, $1,700, something would happen and I would go down to $400, $300. And that happened for a couple of months. And one day I was driving, I said, you know what? You've gotten very comfortable not going. That's fear. Hmm. So you're, you're, you're couching your fear in this, this goal that you have that you're not meeting and you're availing yourself to not get to make that goal. That, I think that evening I came home booked my flight and I was in LA wow. uh, maybe a week later. Cause I said, wow. I'd be darned if I'm gonna be governed by fear. Wow. I wish I still had that. <laughs> you did but, what? Uh, but yeah, I said, I wish I still had that. Uh, now as I, the older I get, the more I'm like, oh my God, I am more fearful than, I, than I, I'm comfortable with. But yeah, but then I was young and full of foolish ambitions and all that kind of thing. And, but I did it. And it was actually one of the best decisions of my life. When most people talk about where we come from, we only go back to slavery. That's a problem. Who is affirming these kids, letting them know that we come from kings and queens? As long as I can remember, I've always felt like I could do anything. There was never a ceiling on the things that I could accomplish. Flex King is a company that sells dope clothing and cologne, but more importantly, reminds you of who you are. This is a hoodie that I purchased. When you look in the mirror, you're telling yourself an affirmation. Your royalty. Abracadabra means your words create reality. So go to www.flexking.io to purchase your thoughtful gear. Words are powerful. Spend time telling yourself the truth until your opinion matches your reflection. We want you to speak who you are into existence until abracadabra it becomes a reality. Again, go to www.flexking.io to purchase your thoughtful apparel.
Walk in your purpose. Walk in your power. Walk in your royalty. Those are the hardest moves to make. It is to uproot your life. Do you do you think that it's it's the the bold moves that gets you, puts you in position? Because um, uh, I, I I saw your post on Facebook, your recent post on oh, Facebook. Oh, today, last this morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. What do you think about what do you think about bold moves? Because that was bold. That was one of your bold moments. Mm -hmm. I think at my core, that's who I am. You know, at my right core, right. I am bold. You know, um, I think the older I get, uh, I feel more of a need to conform, to conform, you know. And, but as I said in my post, you know, this morning, you know, I have to learn to not be afraid of not being normal, you know. Mm -hmm. And because not being normal works for me. I feel like um, David, you know, and the world in this Goliath world mm -hmm. that I just have to use what's intrinsically and inherently mine mm -hmm. to fight or to, 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 to make it, you know, to, to, to get where I'm trying to go. And these little things keep happening. You know, it's funny when I wrote, so I guess for your audience, uh, what happened was yesterday I sent uh, an email to a big wig executive, a, a entertainment executive, and the email was Donnie. It was just really Donnie. It was just me just being colorful and, you know, whatever. And I'm like, this is crazy. So I called a friend of mine and said, hey, is this too much? Is this too much? And he's always, you know, I got to give it to him. Michael Perry is my partner, actually, yeah. with Shaquille. He, uh, like, do, and he's always doing, I got to thank him because he's always encouraging. I'm sorry, I'm hitting the desk. He's always encouraging me to be me, but even when I'm afraid to be me. So anyway, he goes, no, that's great. I love it. You know, it's great. Send it. And so, of course, it took me like an hour <laughs> to say, this is crazy. And so anyway, I sent it. Within a few hours, man, I had gotten this great response. And one of the things that I, one of the words that I used that I, I was like, this is just so crazy. Why am I using this word? Was the very thing that this guy loved. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, you know what, Donnie, be you, be you. And I even like, um, uh, and this has happened twice, like within the last couple of months. Uh, same thing. I'm writing a letter to, I mean, not a letter. I'm sorry. I'm putting together a, um, a synopsis of this show idea that I had for some, some really big executives as well. And I said some things, I'm like, this may be too much, you know, it's too much, but it was me. I felt it. It was in my creative expression, you know, I, I mean, even though it could have been a little bit, um, uh, hyperbolic, it was just, but it was me, you know, it was just mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And so again, I called my friend. I said, man, this look at this. Is this too much? He goes, no. I said, are you sure? He goes, Donnie, it's you. Just wow. do it. Wow. They wow. loved it. That very thing that I was so afraid of just expressing, it was the very thing that now, and I can't say much, I mean, some big stuff is happening with just on that thing right there. So you know, man. we're talking so, about showrunners. You know, we're talking to major showrunners about that very thing I was afraid to to release. Wow. So, so the lesson is, um, if you uh, go forth in your um, and who you are, or your, the thing that makes you different, you go forth in that. If you walk in 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 that thing, then. Uh, speak the way you speak, walk the way you walk, then you'll be rewarded. Right. And you know, as trite as that sounds, because it, sound, it is trite, right. you hear that. I mean, that's it, not new information. It's very trite, it's very cliche, you know, but it's true. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm finding it and learning it to be really true. And it's like, Donnie, why hadn't you done this a long time ago? You know, I mean, just imagine. I just feel like had I had the courage to be authentically me a long time ago, I wouldn't be, I think I would be farther along right now. So let me be anybody listening's cautionary tale to just, just do you, do you, boo. Do you. <laughs> yeah. um, um, 
Have you ever experienced um, low self-esteem or lack of confidence or has seasons of that? Me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I am uh, plagued with that. I am plagued with that. Um, and um, is this therapy or, I mean, I, this seems like this hey, is man, going towards you, 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 you see the couch, right? <laughs> The couch. The couch. Well, I'm I'm sitting on the couch, so, but uh... okay. So I should be this, the table should yeah, be yeah. But, <laughs> but um, yes, I'm trying to just parse this properly because it because it could get deep, and I'm not trying to get that deep. But yeah, I I, I, I struggle with with low self esteem. Um, I've always felt. You know, I wrote a play and I, one of the things I love about writing is you're able to tell all these stories and release all these things inside that you have bottled up without necessarily exposing yourself. You know, you can hide yourself. Like I'm, anything I've ever written, I'm hidden in pro practically every main character. I'm hidden somewhere in that, you know, mm. to throw you off my scent, you know? Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but, Going back to your question, there was a um, a play that I wrote called Inside My Kaleidoscope. And the story is of, um, of a man who's stuck living inside of a kaleidoscope. Mm. And he wants out because it's ever changing. It's not stable and he's just freaking out. And, um, and we learn a lot about him who he is is this he's this insecure being and he and there are two he has two cohorts inside this kaleidoscope that are not physical beings one is myth this this ideology that's kind of personified through himself called mr post mm -hmm. and then god you know mm -hmm. so there are these two things that he, he he struggles and both god and mr post are the antithesis of each other mm -hmm. so um so um but in in that piece the character, which is me, <laughs> in that piece, it was a one man show. So it was clear I couldn't hide in a whole bunch of people. It was me on Front Street completely. But um, he talks about how, you know, his well meaning parents and uh, family who told him all these things about how you have to be good enough and you have to be twice as good. And, you know, all these things that black parents have to tell their children, or, or the, no, I shouldn't say have to tell, that they tell their children, especially in my day, what they told their children to, so they could, you know, give them an edge up and to help them deal with the world that they knew that their child would face. But one of the things I don't think they, they didn't intend, and I don't think they were aware of is that those things also can have the adverse effect, you know, because for you to tell me that I got to be better, that tells me I'm not good enough. You know, if I have to constantly be better and mm -hmm. maybe it's just my own weird interpretation mm. and somehow I never felt I was good enough. I never felt I was as good as the white person, uh, smart as the white next white person, because it was just like they were my everybody made this white person so amazingly huge and wonderful and everything that I somehow had to do something to be better, which means just naturally I was not enough. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it makes sense because what you're saying is when somebody says to you, you got to be better than the white man, that means to, to you, you took it in as I'm not as good as the white man. Right, and 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 that, and that's just, and I, I'm sure other people in heaven because I know a lot of people, especially my age. That's you know parents and family and friends, you know, advise them in that manner. But yeah, for me, being my weird self, I yeah it was just. I mean, I wasn't aware of it until I became an adult, and I just started to process all this stuff. Yeah, it was yeah. all these messages, but it wasn't just that. It was just all the messages about the white man and you know, how things are whatever. And somehow it was just like, wow, then, you know, cause I sometimes think too deeply and I overanalyze and probably that was taking place at an early age. But uh, yeah, I grew up in the shadows of this illustrious white man who I had to somehow overcome and be better than, you know? And I don't think, 
you know, that's probably the the message that my parents and loved ones intended, but it's what I got. Yeah, but you know, it's I think it's and that's 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 something else because I think when when um anytime someone talks to you, um, you know, to a child or anytime like we're talking and if I if I see that you don't get it, I'm supposed to communicate effectively and I'm supposed to I'm supposed to I'm supposed to be able to tell whether you understood what I said. So maybe the practice could be, um, did you understand when I said yes? Okay, what did I say? What did it mean? Say it back to me, like you, you know what I mean? So I my my my, my it's my responsibility that you understand what I'm saying to you. Does that make sense? And so maybe But you know what? You know what, Mike? I I I don't, it, had that happened in that moment, I wouldn't have been able to articulate that. I right. don't think I was more sophisticated because not only did I internalize that for me, but it was all black people. Anybody that looked like me, we were not good enough, period, to exist on this earth. Uh, I never even, see, when I hear it, I hear it as it, it was intended and you you heard it differently. And so, which could mean a lot of other people heard it differently and had that same feeling about themselves because of what- That's where my self-hatred came from. The, the, you know, being, you know, at one point, and this is so embarrassing. Uh, at one point, um, yeah, I was not necessarily, a sh I always felt like I had to overcompensate for being black, you know? And it, particularly around, now around black people, I was fine, but around white people, I was never comfortable in my own skin. I never felt adequate, you know? Mm -hmm. And e and it wasn't until I realized, you know, and this is years later, I'm like, I was sitting down with some white people. I'm like, man, they're not that, not that much smart. They really ain't, some of these people ain't smarter than me. What the <laughs> hell? And I felt like I had been duped. <laughs> and so that's kind of started the process of my change but it was, I mean, that was in college, you know? And so, but from, you know, uh, infant to, you know, 12th grade, man, I, I was very insecure. And then, and then you, you have to deal with the fact that I'm a big black man too. Mm -hmm. So now I, and I've always been kind of a big statue person. So when I walk into a room especially if there's a room where white people are, you know, I'm accept I've accepted that I have a presence. I'm accepting that now. Denver actually has helped me get there. So, but I've interpreted that wrong too, because I mean, and maybe not all the time, maybe sometimes it was what I was getting, but, um, but, but in some cases, when I walked into a room or walked, and even just being black, walked into a place, you can sense the fear that someone else has or whatever they have going on. You can sense that, you know, getting on an elevator and, you know, white women, you know, and I never even thought about my size. It all just registered to who, to my color, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure which one it was. Sometimes it could have been my size. Sometimes it could have been my color, but for a person to have to deal with all that is traumatic. And it wasn't even until you know, I had a, I went, to, man, I used to go to therapy and, um, and I still need to go back, but I used to go to therapy and I had the a most amazing therapist. She was, she was a sister and she unpacked so much stuff in such a short time when we were talking about just growing up black in America for anybody. And it was such a release for me because she was like, there is a trauma associated with just growing up black in America because all these things that you're explaining that other people experience too is just a byproduct of growing up black in this country Definitely. that freed me from a lot of my angst and whatever and it gave me the the wherewithal to say to start this whole living authentic you know it's been a process and I, and steps but that kind of unleashed you know, something inside of me. Have you ever been told um, 
that your dreams were impossible? Hmm, impossible. I have never been told that my dreams are impossible. However, I have been um, led to believe that my dreams are foolish, whimsical, um, and that I should be pursuing something, a job at the post office. Right, right. <laughs> So it's nothing wrong with working at the post office, but neither is it wanting to be a creative person either. So, right. um, but yeah, so no one has ever had the uh, balls to tell me that my dream is impossible, but they have eluded family members. I mean, and people unintentionally not even realizing what they're saying. You know, I have a friend, she used to always say, oh, yo, little dream not little dream your little something she would they would always be de described with the adjective little or your small something and yeah. she had no clue no clue what she was saying but i i knew what she was saying you know so um yeah so yeah so not impossible but you know not worth you know pursuing and that i should be more serious and more responsible and i question myself you know am i doing the right thing I mean, when I was Uber driving and things would get hard and stuff for me, I would be like, what's wrong with me? I started to believe I was crazy because I'm like, why won't I just stop this and just go out there and get a real job, you know, a real job, you know, whatever that job is. I have, you know, degree, some experience, but, you know, why don't I do that? But I did not want to. I just, everything within me um, wouldn't allow me to do it. But I have to give, because there were times when I, I think I was at the breaking point where I was, was about to do it. Mm -hmm. I have to give a shout out to my cousin, Tawana Blaylock. She, wow. My mom, number one, because she always believed in anything, even if it was impossible, she would be like, yeah, baby, you're going to do it tomorrow. It's going to happen. You know, so that's my mom. She was always like that. <laughs> and so, um, but sometimes you don't, you stop believing your mom, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes like, mm, she don't, she just loves me so much. So it does, her words doesn't matter, but they still kind of did though. Uh, Cause even now, two days ago, I, re I was just kind of thinking about something she said to me. I don't know if it's going to come manifest itself, but she just spoke these amazing, wonderful, positive words over me. And it was from her love, but even now it comforts me like two days ago or whatever, I was comforted by it. But Tawana, my cousin, she, wow. So man, what kind of show is this? <laughs> I thought you could ask me <laughs> my entertainment. So my cousin, one of the things that she did um, when I was really struggling, she worked at Bank of America. I happened to be to bank at Bank of America mm -hmm. and I would sometimes go to my account and there would be money there that I didn't put there. Wow. Because she didn't want me to give up. Mm. And yeah, you have to do this. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. wow. That's got to that's got to be everything, man. Because you know, for people for people to say um, hey man, you have talent. For people just to say that, that means a lot. But then for people to show you with action, like I know you're hurting right. right now. Here you go, and not even say nothing. Right. Right. I mean, and she didn't do it just one time. And even when she and she would always tell me she believed in me. And even when it looked like something was gonna happen and it didn't happen, I mean, she was just there, consistently there. You know, and and it, it just means a lot. And I have to also say, you know, I have a friend who lives in Hawaii now. She was enough and she was a friend, not even a family member. She would always be there to support everything I did. I mean, financially, physically, she would avail herself to be there. Kelly settled. So, you know, God has just 
been good. And even though the most difficult of times, I've had one or two people to just kind of be there to, 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 you know, to help me, you know, to make it, to just encourage me, to keep me motivated, you know, and here I am. And I'm glad I didn't give up. Wow. Talk about, talk about, you know, being, being in the industry, you and I both understand, understand struggle. We understand like a lot of people do not understand struggle. <laughs> talk, talk about, talk about those, those times, like what, what, what was life like? Um, no job or I don't know where food is going to come from. Like, like talk about some moments that you, that you've had that was like that. Okay. I am not one that have been used to being transparent about my business with people mm -hmm. and especially to an audience or whatever, you know, just saying, not even friends, just certain friends. I'm, I'm not even sure if Denver knows the extent of some of this or what I'm about to share. Uh, but one of the things I said, as I prayed before this thing, I just said, Lord, just help me to be transparent, you know, and just to be real. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not, not many people know this at all. Um, I came home one day, uh, one of my neighbors, um, he wanted me to help distribute some political fly flyers or something. So I helped him and we came home and there was this yellow tape around the perimeter of the, uh, the property where I lived. And so I'm like, what the heck is going on? You know, so I go to the police. I say, hey, I need to get to my apartment. He goes, you live, I, he says, no, you can't. I said, I live here. He goes, not anymore, you don't. I'm like, what? He says, this place has been shut down. We, everybody's being evicted because what? it's been, the building has been foreclosed upon and nobody knew. We did not know. None of the residents wow. knew. So at that moment, I became homeless in that moment. You know, all my furniture, my computer, my, and then, you know, I'm pleading, I'm like, dude, I gotta, I need my laptop. I want to give me my, I need to get my laptop. So he says, give me a second. I'll give you five minutes and you need to get that, only that stuff, which is important to you. And you will have to just deal with get the other stuff at another time. But right now, yeah. So anyway, so he was nice enough to load. Let me go get um, my laptop and like five cases of water <laughs> that I have. You serious? Because so, I was like, I, I got the water because I'm like, I don't even know, am I going to be sleeping in my car? What am I going to do, you know? And then my pride, you know, I didn't want to tell any friends, you know, I, I was just like, you know, what am I going to do? So um, I did hang out. I went to visit a friend and ended up just kind of just staying over there for a couple of days. And this is the embarrassing part. So um uh but I'm like what am I gonna do you know I had no money you know anything so long story short I ended up um one of the other neighbors moved back into the place and he cut a hole in his closet so that I could crawl through the closet to get back into my unit and I became a squatter yeah wow yeah so talk about hard times yeah, and then even after that, the police came like some months later and was like, you know, y'all got to leave. Y'all got to get out of here. So we got kicked out again, went back to it again. You know, the police lady, she came and she goes, sir, you know, I'm going to give you a couple of weeks, but please, you got you to gotta do something. And I was looking for jobs. And then now I'm looking for a real job. Can't even, nobody, a job that I knew I had. I mean, uh, yeah, just wouldn't, nothing was happening. And I'm like, what is going on? So I said, okay, um, you know, this is crazy. So when my day came, when she said, you know, she gave me that, I said, okay, I'll honor that. I will not come back. Um, I went to a friend's house and I got deathly ill that night, deathly ill. So my friend had to take care of me for a couple of weeks. Wow. So, yeah. And so that kind of just, and then she, you know, when I started to get better, she, wanted me to stay around so that to make sure I was okay. So that kind of kept my pride intact. I didn't have to tell her I didn't have any place to go. And, um, but then I did, uh, yeah. And then I said, okay, I gotta go back to, I gotta go back home because 
I, I don't have anything. So, but I kept looking for jobs and I'm like, even looking for a job, if I get a job tomorrow, it's not going to change. I need a job. I mean, cause I'm not going to be able to, you know, rent, you have to pay first month and a deposit that equals that, you know, so you're looking at, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars was to move into something, you know, here. But the, the, I um, saw a job that was a uh, kind of like an apartment manager at this art commune. And, um, and part of the job, you get free rent. And I ended up getting the job. Yeah. So that helped me. That helped a lot. So, yeah. So, um, and then, what? Go ahead. Wow. Um... So, so first of all, um, thank you for sharing that because right now I'm talking to um, Academy Award nominee Donnie Epp Wilson, and you're sharing moments that are, are that are so important for people that are going through the same things right now where they're homeless. Um, I've experienced homelessness. I know what that's like, you know. Um, so I definitely understand, um, but man, I mean, you, I never knew that about you. Um, yeah. I don't even think our mutual friend knew. I don't think I told him, no, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, cause I'm, yeah, I think maybe the only person I told was maybe um, my cousin, Tawana. I didn't tell my family other than her. She, nobody else knew, yeah. Wow. It's very embarrassing. And I was, then I was depressed. That's another thing. I was, I had gone into this deep, deep depression. And then I had a friend, he, I was telling, and I told a friend of mine in Miami and he said, Donnie, you're living on the limb. And I'm like, what? He, uh, uh, he says, you're living on the limb or something to that effect. And it made me angry, but then I'm like, okay, I got to snap out of this. I got to mm -hmm. snap out of this depression so that I can, you know, get out of it. Cause I, I mean, it was getting really bad. I mean, I was just like, cause I just didn't see a way. I didn't see any hope, anything. And then I was getting mad at God a little bit, uh, low key. Um, I was just in a bad place. I was in a very bad place. Hmm. Um, like it's a couple of questions I want to ask. Um, I kind of want to go back to Beth. What happened to Beth? Did, when you got to LA, did you, did you, meet with her? Did you talk to her? Is she still in your life? Is she still alive? I called Beth when I got to Los Angeles and she said, good. And that was the last time I talked. Oh, shoot. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Beth, you let us down, Beth. You I'm let us right. down. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so what I did, I started working these temp jobs that I, I don't even know if LA still have the, have these, um, you may know these jobs that specifically targeted for people who are interested in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. So they had Freeman agency is one of them. I uh, can't Freeman. remember. Okay. So there were, there were a couple of them. And so I signed up for all of them. Uh, the problem was I wasn't getting any work. You know, they weren't giving me any work. I'm like, dang. So I had to sign up with Apple One in Beverly Hills. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, you mean 10, uh, 10 agencies? Yes. Oh, my God. Dude, agencies. yes. Dude, yes. do you know how many 10 agencies yeah. I signed up for? <laughs> right. Oh, my so God. I signed up, so I signed up with Apple One and they knew what my goal and where I was trying to go. And they said, we don't get a lot of entertainment stuff, but we're going to try to, we'll, we'll do our best. Yeah. And these people were so amazing to me that they kept me at Rogers and Cowan, the public the entertainment public relations. That was the best they could do. But they put me there. I was the uh, uh, ex executive assistant to this publicist. And um, which actually I learned a lot though in that, in her crate, she was crazy, but uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> and matter of fact, she was so crazy. And then, you know, I, I have a zero tolerance for, for disrespect. And one day, you know, but I was polite and I told her, hey, I'm a grown man. And the way you're talking to me is just not, and she started yelling at me, like, get out of my office. But the people at, at the company, at Rogers and Cowan liked me so much, they moved me to the president to become the executive assistant for, to the president. So of the organization. So that was amazing and cool. 
but it wasn't enough. I'm like, this is not, this is not what I want to do. So one day, oh, and this is how I met. This is actually going to lead up to how I met Shaquille O'Neal. So, so one day, you know, I'm calling Friedman and calling the other ones that really did do entertainment. I'm like, come on, guys, you guys are not giving me assignments. Oh, when they, okay, every now and then they would give me assignment, but it would be like in the basement filing, you know, in the dark in a corner filing. Yeah, been there. Oh I'm my like, gosh. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one time I went to, what was it? It was, um, oh my God. I forgot it was um, not Warner Brothers. Anyway, one of the agencies, this woman, this is back when Rolodex, people had Rolodexes. Remember the Rolodex? With yes. The car? She yeah. Had this over, yeah. She had this big old Rolodex. It was stuffed, huge. And she wanted every, and it was written, everything was written. She wanted them all typed. Oh, God. So I'm just sitting here typing phone names and phone numbers at this roller test. I remember those moments <laughs> like they were yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, so um, so that would be the only one. Those were even few and far between. And so one day, Friedman, who never gave me anything, very seldom, very seldom ever gave me anything, they called me and says, Donnie, we have a job with um, with uh, Rob Reiner. I'm excited. I'm super excited. I'm like, yes, finally. This he, I, this match, this is this heaven lining up, right? So anyway, so uh, I get ready. I'm driving uh, down Sunset, and they text me nine one one. That's when you know we had text. I mean, uh, not, not text pages. They page me nine one one. So I stop at this phone booth, another thing that we don't see. So right, this is right. a very antiquated story. Right. Um, <laughs> so I <laughs> stop at this, um, this uh, phone booth on Sunset and I, I call and said, oh, we're sorry, we made a mistake. There is no job with Rob Reiner. Immediately I knew what had happened because they never gave me jobs like that. They gave it to somebody I, else. Stop. They gave it to somebody else, right. yeah. Yeah, I knew that because they never gave me the good stuff and they probably made the calls and nobody answered and somebody probably woke up and then called back and they said, okay, we're going to go with you. So I was furious. So, and they could tell, I said, okay, because I already knew what was going on. So I hang up, they call me back. They said, oh, we got a, we got a gig for you. And it's filing in the dark underneath the basement again. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. They said, you're not going to do that? I said, no. I said, I thought one of the things in working temp, you get to choose the assignments you want. I'm not going to do it. And they said, and they could tell I was pissed. And they said, you mean to tell me you're not going to help us out? I said, okay, if you need help, I'll do it. But you need to call someone else to get them there. I'll go now to, you know, so that you can fulfill this job, but you need to find somebody to replace me because I'm not going to do it all day. They said, okay, don't worry about it. So anyway, a couple of minutes later, they call me back and they go, Donnie, we, have, we got something good for you. And I'm like, what? And they says, you're going to be working. We got a job for the Big Shack. Now, where I am on Sunset, across the street from this telephone booth was a barbecue place called the Big Shack. <laughs> so uh, because they were uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Hey, yo. So you were like, you were like, nah, man. Nah, man. I got you doing that. <laughs> Close my I, I lost it. I'm like, what? You want me to work at a barbecue place? Oh, I'm sorry. You want me to work at a barbecue place? And it's like, what are you talking about? We said the Big Shack. I said, yeah, I'm across the street from the Big Shack. You know? And they, it was this. <laughs> and I'm like, no, we're talking about Shaquille O'Neal. And I'm like, oh. And then I'm like, so I was so relieved. Because I only took it because I was relieved that it wasn't the barbecue place, but on my way to the big shack, I was like, but he's a basketball player. This is not what I'm trying to do. So that wow. anyway, that's how. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. So, so okay, so three questions, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you roll. Um, okay. So give me... Um, give me a, give me a, 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 a good Shaq story. Um, and I, and I, and I know you knew Kobe, Kobe, um, if you will, uh, give me a good Kobe story. Uh, and the third one is 
um, what was the best advice that you've that you've gotten? Whoa, okay. I think I'll tackle the best advice first. Um, the best advice I got, I've gotten, and I think I've gotten advice in different areas of my life, but I'm for for, for where I am and what I do. Um, I had this um mentor he was a director in dallas and i took one of his um writing classes and he told me that oh wow he told me actually two things i got two advice that came from the same person one as far as my my current vocation and in, in, in this creative world he says um let it out don't edit he says you edit things in your head before you release the creativity you know and he says let it out first and then edit it. Now, for me, that was the best advice that, I mean, I think I'm a pretty decent writer and that was kind of, I think the, the opening for, for my creativity to be, to, to flourish and to become everything that it is. Mm -hmm. The other advice that he gave me, we were actually having breakfast at this restaurant and he says, Donnie, don't ever let anyone um, don't let compliments lull you into mediocrity. So when people tell you how great you are, how wonderful you are, don't allow that to, don't accept that because it'll lull you into mediocrity, mm. you know? And so that was, that was some of the best advice I've, I've gotten. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my best, oh my God, I have so many Shaq stories. Okay. <laughs> let's just go. Well, now we'll, uh, uh Kobe, what was I supposed to give you a Kobe story? Yeah, Kobe story and then Shaq. I don't have a real Kobe was just a cool guy. Kobe was cool. Um I remember when he first joined the Lakers. Um he was young and it was something about him that I just liked. Mm -hmm. And we I don't we and we never had this boom. I never hung out with Kobe or anything like that, but of course I saw him every game. And one of the things that I used to do in my position was we used to invite kids to come, 30 kids to come to the, the forum and then the Staples Center for a game. And then they would get a chance to come down in the locker, well, in the tunnel and meet Shaquille. He'd take pictures with him and we just make it a whole big old thing. Um, and sometimes Shaquille would be unable to do it for whatever reasons. A lot of times he'd be hurt or do the, you know, going through some kind of therapy so, so many times he wouldn't be able to do it. And Kobe had, you know, and sometimes I would like ask Derek Fisher, Robert Ory, the Derek Fisher, Robert Ory, and um, Rick Fox, they were my, the main guys. Uh, until Kobe, one day he would, Kobe started every time, he would always find me and say, do you need me? And he oh, would always man. just look out for me. He would always I always said, do you need me to do that? Do you need me to do it? And when I would see him, we would sometimes we just talk, you know, just yeah. nothing big. We just, he was just human and just cool. And I liked him a lot. And I remember telling him, I said, dude, I hope you never change. In my eyes, I think he was the same guy when he first came to the end. You know, you hear these stories and I'm just like, wow, they just, I just don't think they really know. He's just such a cool guy. Even sometimes to my people at Shaquille thing, they go, you like Kobe so much. Why don't you go work for him? You know, <laughs> because I did. He was just so cool. They, and everybody knew how much I love Kobe. Uh, Shaquille, oh my God. I don't know what's to, <laughs> what's to say. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, okay. I'm gonna tell you, okay. This is a very, this is probably one of the most, um, Oh, wow. Okay. Do we want funny? Uh, okay, I'll give you funny because this has been emotional enough. I'll give you funny. All right, so, cool. okay, so one time we're, um, Robert, Robert Earl, he owns uh, Planet Hollywood and, and uh, All Star Cafes, he used all of those. And he had called me one day and he was like, Donnie, I'm, I have this friend in uh, Ohio. He wants to open up uh, Planet Movies. And we need to get a lot of celebrities there to, um, you know, to celebrate this thing. He says, you know, I want you to help me get a few celebrities in LA. I'll send y'all my private jet and y'all come out for this event. So I said, okay. So anyway, so got together a group of um, celebrities and stuff. So on this plane was me, Shaquille, um, Shaquille's bodyguard, um, 
Tom Arnold, Tom Arnold's assistant, uh, Sylvester Stallone, and Kelsey Grammer. Great. So, yeah, so we're on the on the plane, and I'm sitting on the, the little because what I did, I got there early because I know Shaquille normally, depending, I wanted to see what kind of jet it was because he likes to sit on the couch and lay down because he's so big. So I got there early enough to just sit there so nobody else would do it so he could have that. And uh, so anyway, to so get on the plane, he decides he's gonna sit uh, at, the, at a table with uh, Tom Arnold. So Tom Arnold, I mean, Shaquille always, he liked to play these games with me about ideas and he'll tell me some horrible idea and I'll tell him how horrible it is and then he'll <laughs> want to hear my idea and then he tells me how horrible it is this is a game we play for years right I mean it, 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 it was the same way every time right <laughs> okay 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 <laughs> so anyway so him and Tom Arnold get engaged in this well he starts it with me this whole craziness so Tom Arnold decides he's gonna engage in this thing so he starts you know talking about crazy it just gets just as ridiculous as Shaquille's idea right so I disengage I'm like this is ridiculous so anyway but I'm listening to Tom Arnold and he's saying disparaging things about this person who I'm thinking he's talking about me you know what I'm saying <laughs> oh, oh my god, god. <laughs> oh my so, god. <laughs> So, um, so I'm getting pissed off, right? Because I'm because it's clear. And then when his assistant, who was sitting next to me on the sofa, he says, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry." So I knew that now it was you. I know it was me. That you know everybody else knows is me. So, um, so I'm getting pissed. So I'm like, okay, I'm getting ready to cuss Tom Arnold out. I'm gonna lose my embarrass your kid. I'm gonna lose my job. So when I get off this plane, I'm gonna have to get a commercial plane back to LA. So I mean, I'm just planning how I'm this 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 this, <laughs> this is gonna work because I'm getting ready to cuss Tom on a lot, right? So uh, I planned the whole thing. I was ready. I'm like, okay, so. And then in a moment, Shaquille's bodyguard goes and sits next to Tom Arnold, and then everything stops. So we get off the plane. And Shaquille and I get into the limousine and uh, we're waiting for his bodyguard to get the luggage and stuff. So he says, Tom Arnold pissed you off, didn't he? And I said, yeah. He said, I saw it in your face. He said, I could tell you. He said, I could tell you about to do something. He said, I told uh, Andre, his bodyguard at that time, he said, I told Andre to tell him, lay off you because we love you. So that's my Shaquille. Oh man, that's right, baby. That's all. That's all right. That's all right. Thank you for that, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Hey, Donnie. Uh, it's it's yes. been it's been a pleasure. Um, thank you for being so giving, um, and thank you for being so authentic. Um, and and congratulations. Um, nice. I hope you win. I hope the best uh -huh. things happen for you um i'm gonna be praying for you man you know thank you thank i really you. appreciate you man Whew. okay <laughs> you said okay hard. now get me off this thing <laughs> how do we sign out how do we sign know, out right i'm ready oh. i'm ready <laughs> <laughs> hey man but thanks a lot thanks a lot ladies and gentlemen my friend donnie f wilson